pointer from the history department. And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to today's Erasmus lecture. The Erasmus lecture series actually is celebrating its 25th anniversary this month. Our very first event happened in January 1995 in this room as a way to bring distinguished <coughs> scholars in the humanities to Westmont. Scholars who reflect the spirit of inquiry and winsomeness that characterized the great Renaissance Christian humanist Erasmus. And I'm pleased to say on behalf of the English and history departments who are co-sponsoring this lecture today that our speaker fits that bill very well. Dr. Catherine Gerbner comes to us from the University of Minnesota where she's Associate Professor of History. Uh, she told me earlier today, newly tenured this past spring. And she also currently holds a McKnight Land Grant Professorship at uh, Minnesota. Dr. Gerbner did her undergraduate work in religion at Columbia University and then went on to earn her master's and PhD in history at Harvard University. At Minnesota, she teaches a range of innovative courses on Atlantic history, the history of religions, magic and medicine, and the early modern archive, a whole course for graduate students on how to navigate the process of historical research for that time period around the globe. Her publications include a series of important articles on early modern religion and slavery, which culminated in her recent book, which you can see there and which I have here, Christian Slavery, Conversion and Race in the Protestant Atlantic World, published in 2018 by the University of Pennsylvania Press and widely hailed <coughs> since then, excuse me. For example, the current issue of the journal Church History recognized its importance by asking four other leading scholars to respond to it in a forum in which uh, she then got to respond to them. So we're privileged today to have Dr. Gerbner with us to talk about her book and these broad issues relating to the challenging subject of Christian slavery. Following her lecture, there'll be an opportunity for you all to ask questions. Before she comes, let me say on a more personal note that her husband, Sean, is also with us today. So welcome, Sean. <laughs> At home, they have two daughters, Lolo and Clarissa, who are being um, cared for by Sean's mother, as I understand it. So thanks to Sean's mother as well. And uh, a third child on the way. So congratulations to your family. I first met Catherine four or five years ago at a conference at the Huntington Library. And over those two days, I was repeatedly struck by the astuteness of her mind, but also by the graciousness of her spirit. And for those reasons, it gives me extra great pleasure to share her with the Westmont community. So please join me in welcoming her today. Uh, first of all, hello, and uh, thank you so much, uh, especially to Rick Pointer for inviting me here today. Um, and to the history and English departments that are co-sponsoring this event. Um, that was such a touching and special introduction, so um, thank you so much. So I'm really delighted to be here, um, and uh, especially to you for having me brought, brought me out of Minnesota to uh, California in <laughs> the middle of January. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my book today, Christian Slavery, Conversion and Race in the Protestant Atlantic World. Um, and I want to begin by just addressing the title itself. Um, you know, what exactly do I mean by Christian slavery? I, I think that it sort of strikes some as an odd combination of words. Um, we're probably all familiar with the role that many Christians, uh, both black and white, played in the abolitionist movement to end slavery. And I think that to most people today, uh, Christianity and slavery seem just mutually opposed. But when we look at the history of early America, the picture is much more complicated and uh, frankly a bit darker. So my book and my research look at this more difficult history of Christianity and slavery. So I'm looking at how Europe European Christians tried to reconcile slaveholding with their religious convictions um, and how Christianity also played a role in creating slave law in early America. It's not uh, necessarily easy stuff. Um, and so many people ask me, 
you know, why did you choose to devote over a decade of your life to studying and reading about this? Um, so I want to begin uh, to introduce my research by telling a little bit of a more personal story about uh, how I came to write about this. Because um, I actually didn't intend to write a book called Christian Slavery. Um, instead, my initial objective when I began researching was to write about the origins of anti-slavery and abolitionist thought. This is a copy of the document that really kick-started my research. So I started the, the research for, uh, for what became Christian slavery about 15 years ago um, with this document. And this is a copy of the 1688 Quaker anti-slavery protest, which was the very first document in North America to denounce slavery. So for those of you who um, may not know too much about Quakers or have heard about them only in passing, uh, sort of a quick reminder, they're, just a, they're a small Protestant denomination. They're probably best known for their peace testimony um, and for the important role that they played in the abolitionist movement to end slavery. So I uh, was excited to write about this 1688 protest um, because I had a personal connection to it as well. I grew up in Philadelphia and I went to a Quaker school that was just blocks away from where this anti-slavery protest was written. As it turns out, I had passed the site of its creation hundreds of times as I drove from my home to school every day. I'd also been taught in school about the Quaker role in the abolitionist movement and how important Quakers were to leading this uh, movement to end slavery as well as other sort of social justice movements. So in short, I thought that there was a lot to be proud of, a lot to learn, um, and I was excited to dig in. And the document itself is really extraordinary. extraordinary. So it declares, among other things, that uh, the authors are, quote, against the traffic of men body, has a little bit of the, you know, sounds like a 17th century document, but you get the spirit of it. Um, it continues to explain that slavery cannot be a Christian practice, that it's against the golden rule. Um, and I want to read a few lines of it for you. So the authors write, quote, there is a saying that we shall do to all men like as we will be done ourselves, making no difference of what generation, descent, or color they are. And those who steal or rob men, and those who buy or purchase them, purchase them, are they not all alike? Here is liberty of conscience, which is right and reasonable. Here ought to be, likewise, liberty of the body. So for the 17th century, and I can really say this now because I've read a lot of 17th century documents, this is extremely unusual. It's a document uh, that I think all Quakers, all Christians, all Americans can really be proud of. So I was excited to write about it, um, and I thought that ex examining the origins of abolition would um, show how something so important has had a history and how we could learn about social justice from uh, studying the past. But as I looked closer at the documents, I started to become less interested in the petition itself than in the very last line. These are lines that were added not by the authors of the document, but by the Quakers who represented the Abington Monthly Meeting and the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Um, so they write, we have inspected the matter above mentioned and considered of it. We find it so weighty that we think it not expedient for us to meddle with it here. Below that, there's another line. A paper being here presented by some German friends concerning the lawfulness and unlawfulness of buying and keeping Negroes it was adjudged not to be so proper for this meeting to give a positive judgment in the case, it having so general a relation to many other parts, and therefore at present they forbear it. So if the convoluted language uh, makes you wonder what they're actually saying, I will simplify it, they rejected the protest. So while I had originally intended to study anti-slavery, I felt like this was actually more important. What it revealed is that while a small minority of Quakers rejected slavery in the 17th century, most did not. Despite the fact that I had gone to Quaker school my entire life, I had no idea up to this point that there were Quakers who had also owned slaves. 
Furthermore, I had questions. What did it mean that slavery had so general a relation to other parts? What other parts were they talking about? To answer this question, I had to dig deeper into the 17th century Atlantic worlds. At the time, I was surprised to learn slavery was accepted and common not only among most Europeans, but also among Quakers. Uh, and that wasn't all. Quakers were involved in the slave trade. As it turned out, many of the Quakers in Philadelphia, uh, whose history I had learned growing up, had immigrated not from England, uh, but actually from the Caribbean island of Barbados. Pennsylvania may have been the first Quaker colony, but it was not the first Quaker community in the Americas. There was a large Quaker presence on Barbados where thousands of friends lived. In the 1670s, um, it was actually called the Nursery of Truth because it was by Quakers, right? That they, wherever they were, there was the truth. Um, so because it was so filled with Quakers. When Pennsylvania was founded in 1682, William Penn, uh, who is the Quaker founder of Pennsylvania, and other leading Quakers used their connections to Barbados to purchase enslaved Africans. As Pennsylvania's social and economic structure developed, ties with the West Indies and other trade outlets flourished. So the trade in Barba with Barbados was really a source of pride um, and a symbol of prosperity for many of the English Quakers who thought that slavery was necessary for economic development. And here you get a sense of what the other parts really were. So I realized I needed to tell this story. Like many other stories that are shameful or embarrassing, this one had largely been suppressed in the Quaker histories that I had read. Um, most scholarship about Quakers and slavery in the 17th century, um, even the books that acknowledge that Quakers were slave owners, they were focused on finding the seed of abolition in these early writings. I decided to ask different questions. So instead of reading abolition back in time, I thought it was more important to understand how slave owning Quakers, as well as slave owning Christians of other denominations, fit into their own time. None of them would have predicted the demise of the slave trade or of slavery. So if I really wanted to understand them and the relationship between Christianity and slavery, then I needed a different approach. I also decided to expand the scope of my research beyond Quakers uh, to include other Christian denominations. And here I decided to focus on the Church of England uh, or the Anglicans and the Moravian Church, which is a small uh, Protestant denomination headquartered in Eastern Germany. And these three Protestant denominations, it turns out, uh, these were the first groups to actually send missionaries to try to convert enslaved people to Protestantism. As a result, they tended to sort of spend more time discussing the relationship between Christianity and slavery. So why did these Christians accept slavery? How did they justify slavery within their theological worldview? I also wanted to think about what Christianity might have meant to enslaved and free black men and women who became Christian. When and why did they convert? So these became the new questions that fueled my research. And I started by taking a closer look at Barbados. So um, Barbados, for those who don't know, um, was the most important English colony in the 17th century. It was settled in 1627, and colonists soon began to first plant tobacco and then sugar. And this is when it really took off uh, in terms of uh, its economic uh, production. So English colonists on Barbados initially relied on a joint labor force of European indentured servants and um, enslaved Africans. But by the 1650s, enslaved Africans had become the majority of the labor force. And it was around this time that Quakerism also started to flourish on the islands. There were two Quaker missionaries, um, Anne, Austin, or Anne Fisher and Mary Austin, who landed on the island in 1655. And they uh, successfully converted, or as Quakers would say, convinced um, several island residents. And so by the 1670s, two decades later, there were thousands of Quakers living on Barbados, all but four of whom were slave owners. Um, and this map was actually produced by a Quaker, Richard Ford, a new map of the, of the island of Barbados. 
Um, and the map itself is probably the most detailed map we have of Barbados from the 17th century, but it caused a big uh, sort of controversy at the time because Richard Ford being a Quaker, Quakers are anti-war, they, they refuse to uh, bear arms, and so he refused to depict any of the military forts on the islands. And so when the governor of Barbados sent this to England, he wrote a note complaining about how the, the, the creator, the surveyor was a Quaker. And even though there were no military forts, don't worry, we ac they actually had a lot of military defenses. Um, so we know a lot about random things about Quakers from Barbados. We, it's really, really hard though to actually figure out what they thought about slavery when they first encountered it. What we do know is that in the 1670s, the Quaker founder George Fox, who's pictured here, um, de decided to visit Quaker communities in the colonies and Barbados was his first stop because Barbados, of course, was sort of the center of the English American world. There, he became deeply concerned about the practice of slavery, um, but not necessarily for all of the reasons we might hope. So um, he did urge Quakers to consider manumission in some cases, but he did not call for the ends uh, of slavery as a practice. Instead, he did something else. He urged friends to worship with the enslaved people in their households, and to introduce them to Quakerism. So in many ways, I think this is kind of disappointing. Um, and in fact, again, much of the scholarship here about Fox's visit to Barbados is the debate about whether we can call his remarks proto-anti-slavery or not. Um, but again, I think when we focus just on anti-slavery, we miss a really important point. And that important point has to do with the reaction of other colonists on Barbados to the Quakers. So in 1675, which was a few years after Fox's visit, English colonists discovered that a group of enslaved men were planning rebellion. In response, the English colonists took drastic measures. They executed the enslaved rebels, they tortured other enslaved people, uh, they rewarded the informants um, and gave the one enslaved woman who had tipped off uh, her master her freedom. They also, so that's all kind of expected. If you, if you know the sort of the history of slavery and responses to slave rebellions, that's all sort of par for the course. But they also did something kind of unusual. They passed an act that forbid Quakers from worshiping alongside enslaved men and women. So I wanna read a passage from the act here. This act asserted that enslaved people had, quote, been suffered to remain at the meeting of Quakers as hearers of their doctrine and taught in their principles whereby the safety of this island may be hazard. If the act continued, any enslaved person was, quote, found with the said people called Quakers at any time of their meeting and as hearers of their preaching, the Quaker, that Quaker would have to pay a fine. Within a year of this act's passing, the Quaker Ralph Fretwell was prosecuted for having 80 enslaved people present at a meeting at his house, and Richard Sutton was taken to court for, uh, quote, 30, 30 enslaved people being present at a meeting. What is going on here? Why would Quakers, we just talked about how they're anti-war, they won't even bear arms, why are they being blamed for a slave rebellion when they have a peace testimony? So I've learned in historical research that when something doesn't seem to make sense, you need to dig in. It's often these incongruencies that reveal something fundamentally important about a particular place and time. So 17th century Quakers, I came to understand, were radical, but not because they were abolitionists. Instead, Quakers like George Fox were radical because they suggested that blacks and whites should meet together for worship. And Quakers were not the only Christians who were persecuted for meeting together with enslaved people. As I began to investigate this issue further and to read through the Anglican and the Moravian sources, I realized that there were some very important similarities um, in each of these denominational experiences. So in each case, Protestant slave owners attacked missionaries and enslaved Christians for meeting and worshiping together. On the island of St. Thomas, for example, Moravian missionaries and black converts were beaten and attacked by white colonists. 
Slave owners stole Bibles from enslaved Christians and they burned Moravian books. Um, it is a letter either written or probably more likely dictated by a free black Moravian woman named Maratta um, who lived on the island of St. Thomas. And she was writing to the Queen of Denmark to ask her to support black Christians. Um, and St. Thomas at that time, right now it's part of the US Virgin Islands. In uh, the 18th century, it was part of the Danish West Indies, which is why she was writing to the Queen of Denmark. So in it, she asks the Queen to support the black women of St. Thomas because the slave owners would not allow them to quote, serve the Lord Jesus. Um, the petition is written first in Maratha's West, uh, native West African language, which is um, on the left, and then translated into uh, Dutch Creole, which is on the right. And Dutch Creole was, you know, don't ask me why, actually I can't answer this question, but was the lingua franca of the Danish West Indies. Um, so Maratha's appeal was accompanied by another letter, uh, also written in Dutch Creole and signed by several other black Moravians on St. Thomas. Uh, that letter went into more detail about the problems facing enslaved Christians. The white planters, quote, beat and injure us when we learn about the Savior, they wrote. They burn our books, call our baptism the baptism of dogs, and call the brethren beasts. As I looked closer at these and other documents, I began to understand why English slave owners found the prospect of slave conversion, conversion to be so threatening. First of all, when enslaved people became Christian, and specifically Protestant, it challenged the justification for slavery at the time, um, which was largely based on religious difference. Um, and I'll come back to this, but we have to remember that there was no concept of race as we understand it today in the 17th century Protestant colonies. Second, um, in some cases, missionaries taught enslaved people to read the Bible uh, and to write. And this was extremely unpopular among slave owners. And when you start thinking about how important it is to control mobility and knowledge, you can begin to understand why, um, especially when you know, you're not supposed to leave your plantation and the only way you're allowed to is if you have a written past. You know, learning how to write is very, very powerful. Um, third, when enslaved Christians would meet for worship, white colonists feared that they were plotting a slave rebellion. So this is exactly what happens in Barbados. When Quakers started to include enslaved people in their worship meetings, remember we had one person with 80, another with 40, uh, English slave owners reacted aggressively. When the Quaker William Edmondson visited Barbados in 1675, for example, he was attacked by the governor of Barbados for, quote, making the Negroes Christians and making them rebel and cut our throats. So I want to pause again here because these documents reveal what I think are some misunderstood aspects of colonial slavery. What this shows us is that English slave owners thought of Christianity and specifically Protestantism as a religion that was for free people. And they worried that a baptized slave would demand freedom and possibly rebel. As a result, they excluded uh, most enslaved people from Protestant churches. I felt like this was very important um, and that it had not been fully recognized. Um, this was also very different from the role that Catholicism played in Spanish and Portuguese, co Portuguese colonies, uh, where, and I can talk about this more in the Q&A if people want, but um, enslaved people were baptized as part of the process of enslavement, right? So you were supposed to be baptized, um, and that, was, so that sort of provided the justification for slavery. This was not the case in uh, Protestant colonies where, you know, there was a Protestant Reformation. People were fighting about, you know, what, what constitutes sort of the proper preparations for baptism. So it's extremely complex. In any case, I gave this, uh, this sort of pattern that I recognized a name in my book. I called it Protestant supremacy. So what do I mean by Protestant supremacy? Um, I came to understand that Protestant supremacy was the forerunner of white supremacy. White supremacy uses race to create inequality. But as I was saying before, in the 17th century, race as we know it had not yet been invented. And most significantly, the concept of whiteness had not been created. 
So slave owners created the ideology of Protestant supremacy, which used religious to, uh, religion to justify inequality and slavery. And I turned to the legal archives uh, to understand this better. I read through all of the laws that, that were passed in the island of Barbados in the 17th and early 18th centuries. And in the earliest slave laws, I found, colonists did not refer to themselves as white. Instead, they called themselves Christians. So Protestants Protestant slave owners constructed a class caste system based on Christian status. So uh, you would have Protestant, uh, especially Anglican slave owners at the top, um, and then non-conforming Protestants, uh, Catholics and Jews were viewed with suspicion and just distrust, but they were granted more protections than the quote, heathen slaves. Um, and of course, these are not actually heathens, right? But uh, many actually, some, we now know that there were some enslaved people who had already converted to Christianity in Africa, especially in the Kingdom of Congo. Um, and there were also many Muslims who were enslaved and brought to the Americas. But heathen was uh, the word that the Protestants used in the, uh, not recognizing any of these or the African religious traditions that um, enslaved people brought with them. So we can see an example of uh, Protestant supremacy in the document on the right. No, you're right, yes, okay. Um, this is a travel account written by an English man named Richard Ligon. Ligon uh, published an account of his three-year visit to Barbados uh, in the 1640s. And in one story, he describes an encounter with an enslaved man who told him that he wanted to become a Christian. Ligon promised to help this man achieve his goal, and so he spoke to this man's owner. Um, Ligon was surprised when the slave owner replied that, quote, the people of that island were governed by the laws of England, and by those laws, we could not make a Christian a slave. Ligon explains that his request was different than that, and he desired to make a slave a Christian, not to make a Christian a slave, but the slave owner, still at last sort of comprehending Ligon's request, replied that, quote, being once a Christian, he could no more account him a slave, and so lose the hold he had of him as, as a slave um, by making him a Christian. Again, convoluted language, but I think you get the point. And by that means, this should open such a gap that all the planters in the island would curse him. Okay, so it's, it's uh, bigger than just sort of a fear that uh, Christianity and slave, you know, uh, someone can't be both a Christian and a slave. This story shows how English slave owners believed that their status as, Protestant, uh, as Protestants was really inseparable from their identity as free Europeans. And it also shows how slave conversion was viewed as a threat to the system of slavery. So this, this slave owner was afraid that baptism was, would threaten his claim to owning the slave and that other slave owners would curse him because of the threat of rebellion. This association between Protestantism and freedom was so strong um, that again, most slave owners came to dismiss the idea that enslaved people were even eligible for Protestant baptism. By 1680, for example, um, the Lords of Trade and Plantation in London wrote to a group of merchants in Barbados to inquire as to, quote, the unhappy state of the Negroes and other slaves in, in Barbados by their not being admitted to the Christian religion. And the so-called gentlemen of Barbados explains that, quote, the conversion of their slaves to Christianity would not only destroy their property, but endanger the island inasmuch as converted Negroes grow more perverse and intractable than others. So these documents help to explain why it was so controversial for Protestant missionaries to introduce enslaved people to Christianity. It threatened to undermine Protestant supremacy. And as a result, planters regularly attacked missionaries and enslaved converts and free converts, uh, verbally and physically, and blamed them for slave rebellions, regardless, to, uh, regardless of evidence to the contrary. So the next question is, how did this change? How did Protestant supremacy become white supremacy? So we've already seen a little bit of how Protestant supremacy was challenged. It was challenged by missionaries, including the Quakers, and it was also challenged by enslaved and free blacks who wanted to become Christian or did become Christian. So people like Maratha. But in each case, it was challenged in a different way. So I'll start with the missionaries. 
What I found is that Quaker, Anglican, and Moravian missionaries responded to Protestant supremacy by trying to argue that Christianity and slavery were actually perfectly compatible. They drew on biblical descriptions of slavery as well as sort of the idea of the godly household to encourage slave owners to allow enslaved people to convert. Uh, they noted that Christian slavery had a long and well-established history in Europe in the Catholic American colonies, which is true. And they also tried to defend slave conversion by arguing that enslaved Christians would be more docile and harder working than their, quote, heathen counterparts. So in short, Protestant missionaries responded to this hostile environment of, Pro of, of uh, Protestant supremacy by articulating and promoting a vision of what I call Christian slavery. So hence the title of the book that reconciled Protestantism with bondage. And for example of this, uh, we can again turn back to the Quaker William Edmondson, who I mentioned very briefly before. He's often thought of, one as, thought of as one of the first anti-slavery Quakers. But when he was attacked by the governor of Barbados for worshiping alongside, ens alongside enslaved people, he responded by saying this, it was a good work to bring them to the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. And that would keep them from rebelling or cutting any man's throat. So the implications here are clear. Conversion would make slavery safer. It would make enslaved people less rebellious. For another example, we can turn to the Moravian mission on the island of St. Thomas, where the first two missionaries, Leonard Dober and David Nietzschemann, uh, who are both radical pietists from Eastern Germany, when they initially set out to go, they actually imagined selling themselves into slavery to better evangelize. I think revealing a understanding of slavery that was not race-based, but was more malleable. After just four months in St. Thomas, however, I, Nitschmann returned to Europe and he revealed a surprising and I think really important new commitment to a, a new understanding of the institution of slavery that was based on his experience in the islands. Um, once he was back in Copenhagen, so after his mission, he met with Princess Hedwig and the senior Chamberlain von Plessen, who told, them, told him that they wanted to grant freedom to any enslaved people who converted to Christianity. Uh, they, sort of, they thought that this was both moral and efficacious, um, but to their surprise, Nietzschemann replied, such an idea would just make them hypocrites. The apostle said, whoever was called to be a servant should not seek to be rid of his place, but rather remain a menial laborer and serve his master according to his desires. That way the masters will also be convinced and they will rejoice when their Negroes convert. Nietzschemann's insistence that enslaved people should absolutely not be manumitted after baptism was an important theological adaptation to West Indian slave society. Noting that enslaved people, quote, this is his words, had the ability to take on the appearance of being Christian quite easily without any true transformation of the heart. Those of you who study pietist history, can, you know, you can hear that language here. Nietzschemann reveals both his commitment to pietist reform and his beliefs that um, enslaved and free blacks might take advantage of religious opportunity to improve their own standing. So after just a few months in St. Thomas, Nietzschemann had come to the conclusion that Protestantism needed to be fully divorced from freedom in order to prevent both opportunistic conversions and planter wrath. Um, now, most scholars have sort of thought that this type of argument came from planters or that it came sort of later in the history of Christian missions. But I think that these documents show us that they're actually a pretty uh, immediate adjustment to slave life that was developed by the earliest Protestant missionaries in response to Protestant supremacy. Now, enslaved Christians fought Protestant supremacy in a different way. So I'll just put Maratha's letter back here. Um, they tended to argue that they had a right to practice Christianity um, and to read the Bible and to worship together. And over time, more and more enslaved and free people of color fought their way into Christian churches, despite sort of the, um, you know, literal, like some physical attacks, but also the, 
the pressure not to from the majority of Protestant slave owners. Um, and, you know, they did so for a lot of different and complicated reasons. We were talking earlier uh, in, in, our, in class today about how hard it is to really wrap our minds around the fact that people who lived in 1700 were just as complex as we are. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they were. And so the reasons that enslaved and free people of color joined Protestant churches were many. Um, they were theological, they were practical, there, there were social motivations. In my research, I've seen um, oftentimes group, like, you know, one, one person will convert and then a family, a family will sort of join the church in the next few years. So you see communities building, um, you see people wanting to learn how to read and write, um, and you see a lot, especially in the Moravian records, sort of the, for the Moravian theology focuses very, very heavily on the, the suffering body of Jesus. And I think it's not hard to see how that might be appealing to people who were, um, you know, cruelly treated as enslaved people. So one of these individuals uh, who converted was named Charles Cuffey. Um, Cuffey was born into slavery and was baptized on September 9th, 1677 in an Anglican uh, church in Barbados. The minister noted uh, that Cuffey had recently been freed, which made him the first free black man to be baptized on the island. In 1689, 12 years after his baptism, Cuffey brought two children to the baptismal font. Thomas, who is age 10, and Mary, who is age 5. The minister again noted that they were the son and daughter of Charles Cuffey, free Christian Negro. By joining the Anglican Church, Cuffey was making a claim for himself. As a free Christian man, he had acquired most of the markings of a freeholder. And according to Barbadian law at the time, uh, he would be eligible to vote in elections, and at least hypothetically, to run for office if he could acquire uh, enough property. So why did things change? It was in response to free black Christians like Charles Cuffey that English slave owners began to create what we now sort of call white supremacy. Soon after Cuffey brought his children to the baptismal font, Barbadian lawmakers wrote a new law, and it redefined citizenship for the first time to include the word white as well as the word Christian. Um, and I wanna emphasize how different this is. This was one of the very first times that the word white was ever used in the legal records. Remember I mentioned before, um, you <laughs> read through all the laws in Barbados in the 17th century. Um, so this law, the 1697 law, declared that every white man professing the Christian religion who hath attained to the full age of one and 20 year and hath 10 acres of freehold shall be de deemed a freeholder. 12 years later, lawmakers read, refined their definition of, of whiteness even further. So this 1709 law clarified that a quote, white person could have no extract from quote, a Negro. Um, in my mind, I know of no earlier law that sort of establishes what we'd now call a one drop rule um, as the definition of whiteness. And it lays a new foundation for slavery and social oppression that I think makes race seem like a natural category, right? Something that's innate. Um, what we see here is the codification of whiteness as a legal, legal category that was specifically intended to exclude free black Christians like Cuffey from the full rights of citizenship. Um, so again, we often take something like whiteness as a given, but it has a really specific history. We assume that race is biological. I think that's sort of the uh, tendency among the general population. Um, that it's a biological category, but what I think these records show us is that it's actually, we could call it a political category. Um, slave owning politicians actively created and defined this category of whiteness as part of a political strategy to protect slave ownership um, and to restrict the voting rights of free blacks. And it was again, in direct response to the growing and emerging uh, population of enslaved and free black Christians. <laughs> 
So with the creation of whiteness, something else changed, which is that slave conversion eventually becomes less threatening. Whiteness, rather than religious difference, becomes the new way to justify and enforce slavery. And over time, pro-slavery Christians would build on the arguments, sort of in an ironic way, of the early missionaries who, you know, they had attacked, to argue that slavery was ordained by God and necessary for evangelization. So, what are we to do with this history? Um, I want to end by making a few concluding remarks to bring this history back to the present. So first of all, I'll say that when we as a society are increasingly aware of the lasting effects of white supremacy, um, it's important to think about where whiteness actually comes from. Again, most people think of race as biological, uh, but I think this belief is itself destructive because it naturalizes race and allows us to forget that uh, whiteness was created in order to legalize and justify inequality. In other words, I think it's important to acknowledge that there were actual individuals who made actual decisions that led to both Protestant supremacy and to white supremacy. You know, someone, they clearly, they had a discussion, right? When you think about lawmakers sitting in a room, they put white in there um, when it wasn't there before because of specific circumstances. 12 years later, you can imagine, and actually the, the records say, there was some discussion and some controversy about this, so we clarified, right? So, and you can just imagine, what was that controversy? Did, someone, did Charles Cuffey actually come and try to say, oh, but you know, I was born enslaved, but I have you know, one white parent, or this is it. There were many mixed race uh, people of color who were enslaved and free. Um, and so sort of that, the, the conversation that led to this law, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say I love to speculate about it, but I think it's important to speculate about it. Because when we do, we recognize that it was an actual conversation and it was more conscious than I think we might, assume. who was, I think there's a, Winthrop Jordan call, there's a, calls slavery the unthinking decision. Um, and I, I actually, I don't know if I agree with that, right? There, people make decisions. Um, and maybe it's unthinking, but it's not, in a way, it's, it's not sort of unintentional. So second, I think it's important to think about the many different meanings that religion had in slave societies. So in Protestant supremacy, obviously we can see that religion is used as a source of oppression, um, but that's not what it meant to the enslaved men and women who fought hard to be baptized. And I think that our histories have to keep these, uh, these complexities in balance, and especially not to allow sort of this oppressive regime of Protestant supremacy to sort of cloud our ability to be sensitive to the experiences of enslaved and free black Christians. Um, and I think that, again, this is a conversation we were having earlier today in the class. Um, there was so much propaganda in the, in the 19th century, right before the Civil War, where pro-slavery theologians were, were talking about how, you know, bringing Christianity to the slaves was the great thing that, you know, slavery did and that it made, uh, you know, enslaved people better people and they were more obedient and more loyal. I mean, this was propaganda from the 19th century, but it has really clouded our perception of the role that Christianity played in the early colonies and what it what it meant to the, the people who chose to convert. You know, and we have so few records, we need to really hold on to the ones we do, like Murata's letter. And then finally, for those people who identify as Christians, I think this, this history serves as a challenge to think about what it really means to combat oppression. Um, and I think this means confronting the uncomfortable aspects of Christian history. You know, I think it's easy to relegate the blame for slavery and oppression to others, you know, whether it's people in the South or in the past. Um, but when we do that, we're really erasing um, Christian complicity in and support for slavery throughout the American colonies. Um, and, you know, into the 19th century, sometimes to the present day, um, we're also ignoring the close connection between Christianity and the creation of whiteness. Um, and again, it's an uncomfortable past, but I think it's one that we need to recognize. And looking carefully at this historical relationship, 
between Christianity and slavery, um, I think that is what can teach us a lesson about social justice. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but I do think it shows that it's not enough to be radical. You know, going back to sort of the Quaker radicalism of the 17th century, we have to be really vigilantly aware of history itself, of the complexities of inequality, and how the, the way that inequality is justified today was created in the past. Um, and finally, I'll just end by saying that history is never inevitable, right? Things could have developed differently. Um, historians love to talk about contingency. Um, I love to talk about counterfactuals. Um, but we all know that many Christians, uh, black and white, played this really important role in the abolition, abolitionist movement, showing that Christianity could and was used to support freedom and emancipation. So, you know, I think we should recognize, remember, um, and be proud of these abolitionist Christians and learn from them. But we can't whitewash the rest of the history or we risk repeating it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions if people have them. I have a, a quick question, and then maybe I have a longer question. <laughs> Do you know if Charles Cuffey was related to Paul Cuffey? I have thought about So Paul Cuffey was the um, 18th century, right? 18th century sailor. I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> I wish they were related. Um, but, um, he, but Cuffey was a pretty common name. Uh, and so the, the chances are unlikely, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you? Oh, uh, yes, it's written here. Um, I was reading your introduction, and you talked about, I um, mean, you talked about it in your talk as well, this kind of transition. Um, yeah. I will just read it to you. Um, by the end of the 17th century, the term white had begun to replace Christian as an indicator of freedom and mastery. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that transition. Yeah. Um, and the uh, specific ways in which uh, you see in the language that people use, yeah. how they're understanding a white <coughs> identity and a Christian one at this moment of mm. transition and shift. Yeah, it's a, it's a transition, but it's one of these very long transitions. You know, you can, f and, and actually, when, when I looked at all the laws in Barbados, for example, you can find the word white as early as I think the 1670s or so, but it's never as this kind of fixed racial category. It's as a, like a physical descriptor, you know? And so when you look at what it's paired with, it's always an adjective, right? There's no such thing as whiteness. And so really the transition we're looking at is how does something go from being an adjective to a noun, um, like as a, a sort of, a, and how does it become a coherent category, I, you know, I say the word, I say legal category, right? How does it come to have this legal import in a new way? Um, and that, I think, takes, uh, you know, half a century at least. You know, it's in, by the 1720s and 30s and 40s, whiteness is much more, uh, I mean, you see it, you see it sort of much more often, not only in legal records, but also in just writing in general. Um, and in terms of how is it defined, well, that's like, oh, it's, that changes, right? It, it expands and contracts over time. And that itself is you know, an important and fascinating story. You know, uh, who is considered white and who is not? Um, you know, the his if we look at the history of immigration in the United States, um, the, there was, there were certainly times when sort of southern, uh, southern Europeans were not really considered fully white. When I, you know, the Irish love to t talk about it, they weren't considered <coughs> white. Although Irish were not slaves, there's a whole, there's a whole argument about this. And you know, there were a lot of Irish indentured servants on Barbados since they were never enslaved. Um, just to clarify that for anyone who's wondering. Anyway, but the but the point is that. It is, um, it, it is a term that, that shifts over time according to who has power and, uh, and to the political sort of uh, the politics of the time. Again, so Jews have, have had a history of being included in the term white and not being included in the term white. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think that it's one of these words where no matter what period of history you're looking at, you should say, 
okay, who here is being included and who is not, and why, and that will tell you a lot about how society functions. Uh, thank you so much for a very captivating talk, and uh, very much look forward to looking at your work. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about um, this notion that conversion challenges the basis of religious difference, that this was a very Protestant uh, view in the context of yeah. Barbados. Because uh, why is it that this particular context evoked that fear? There's so many other in imperial contexts where yeah. conversion is perfectly, uh, I mean, totally promoted. <laughs> Absolutely. The Portuguese, the Portuguese wanted to convert the Spanish, the Dutch, um, roughly at the same time, if not even yep. before this time that you're talking about. And there were some instances where the fear of, you know, converting the natives could lead to rebellion and uh, um, empower, kind of empowerment or, um, you know, I work on India, so you can mm. get untouchables and they might not do their servile roles anymore. Right. Um, but still, people still wanted to convert. So what right. is unique about this context that, that evokes this kind of this, this fear that this difference is going to be defaced? I, I have thought about that for a long time and I, I think that there are and you know I sort of mentions I can talk about this in the Q&A but right the Spanish and the, the Catholic colonies the, it's a very different story um, and really as a res partly as a result there are very different sort of the, the way that race functions in Latin America is very different from here but so in, in to answer your specific question I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of different things that come into play one is uh, looking at the history of the Protestant Reformation and sort of increasing associations between being a true Christian but you know a true Protestant and being truly free um, another one is the sort of the history of slavery in Europe um, and sort of the, the transition to sort of, people don't say the, the feudal system or serfdom anymore, they say the manorial uh, system in Northern Europe. So that the, the laws governing slavery were not as, um, didn't carry through as much as they did in Southern uh, Europe where you have sort of consistent chattel slavery um, until ca the Catholic colonization of the Americas through that. Um, but I think that another answer has to do with uh, logistics and administration, <laughs> uh, which sounds boring, but you know, we got to remember part of the Protestant Reformation was destroying all the, the orders that did all the missionary work in the Catholic colonies, right? So you don't have any Jesuits going to the British colonies. That matters. You don't have Dominicans. Or, you know, so the, there was, a, there was a, a real vacuum and lack of um, missionary funding and <laughs> missionaries um, in, the, in the 17th century British, uh, British Americas. You know, we have to remember, this is the English Civil War. They're, they disestablished the national church for a period of time. They don't even, they're not even getting new ministers and they don't agree on what the Church of England should be. Um, so there was a huge bureaucratic rupture um, in Protestant churches that I think leads to a lack of strength from the missionary voice that uh, once missionaries start to arrive in the colonies, you already have a system which uh, Protestant slave owners have been able to sort of get a stranglehold. We think of the British colonies as uh, sort of, you know, more like the, develop the development of like democr small democratic societies, right, where there was a lot of lay government control. Um, but what that also means is that each colony was really had <laughs> like the elite of those colonies had a stranglehold on the, what the laws were going to be. And when the, you know, the, the, ch the King of England's, you know, after, um, you know, in the late 17th centuries tries to assert some uh, dominance and say, you need to evangelize and allow enslaved people to convert to Christianity. Basically, the slave, this is part of, they see this as, that is an infringement on their freedom. They, they want to be able to say who is part of the Protestant church and who isn't. And they control the, the, the assemblies. They can make life hellish for the, the, the royally appointed governor. Um, so there are a lot of uh, kind of really specific uh, 
governmental reasons for who has control over the uh, creation of laws, the Catholic colonies were far more centralized, the church was stronger, the, 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 um, they had what's called the patronato real, or the padra, uh, so where the church and crown, pope gave, the pope gave the monarchs um, co sort of control over the church and the colonies, which incentivized them to have, to ch use, uh, in some ways, they were, <coughs> Um, promoting Christianity among enslaved people to check the power of the colonists who would push back against monar monarchical power. So I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. <coughs> yeah. First, I want to reiterate with Dr. Mullen who says thank you so much for coming all the way from Minnesota. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> oh, I literally found out yesterday. Sorry, I'm not a, I, I don't pay attention, but I. Apparently, people were really upset. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, my question is, uh, a unique characteristic of American slavery was the brutality and the dehumanization. And I was putting into a, a timeline, was that more of under the Christian era of slavery, or was that more during the transition to whiteness, mm. where they classified race? I just looking at what really brought that brutality. Was it more of the Christian or the whiteness? I would say, I mean, I hate to sort of say this slavery was more or less brutal because they're all dehumanizing in their own ways. Um, I'll say that uh, really a lot was determined by type of crop. I mean, it's, ne it's like a neither nor answer. Um, you know, in terms of your like your daily life as an enslaved person, if you were uh, if if you were in the Caribbean in a, in a like a sugar plantation colony. Um, there was a, the rate of mortality, there were more deaths than births, I'll put it that way. Um, in, in colonies that produced tobacco or wheat, um, you know, they were dehumani dehumanizing in different ways. W Virginia, for example, by the uh, sort of 18th century, early 19th century, had become a wheat producer. Um, there were more births than deaths among the enslaved population. But that meant that, uh, owners used that as capital to and separated families all the time. Uh, so there was a lot that was determined based on what kind of economic production was, was existing in the colony. Um, now did Christianity, and how did Christianity and whiteness shift the, you know, there are, there were Christian slave owners who tried to, you know, change their behavior who, because of their Christian beliefs. And there were Christian slave owners who were the cruelest among the, you know, Frederick Douglass writes about this in his, um, the, his autobiography about when his, his master convert, you know, became a born again Christian, how he would whip with more glee, right? So I, I think that there, it's actually, I don't think that we can, we can really, that the Christianity versus race-based justifications are as good a predictor for how someone is going to behave than um, a ver variety of other factors. You made a conscious decision not to read a kind of er abolitionism back into the 17th century. Do yes. you find it easier to read a kind of Protestant supremacy forward into the 21st century? <laughs> unholy alliance between the religious right and white supremacy. Well, I think it explains a lot about some aspects of that, the current history when we look back <coughs> at the way, you know, Protestantism was used to justify um, slavery. You know, it's sort of something that might seem to sort of a, sort of a, a conscientious Christian today, abs like, so strange, so inexplicable. I think it does help to s say that, you know, this has deep roots, but it doesn't have to be this way. Um, either this afternoon or earlier today, you, you mentioned that you enjoy counterfactuals. But just now I said that. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's just try to put ourselves back into the position of these missionaries. <laughs> and what they're dealing with in terms of the opposition that you've laid out is substantial, even violent at times. And so what are their options? Well, seemingly their options are to do what they did, which we find 
most of us would find problematic in a range of ways. Yeah. Another option is not to try, to pack up their bags and go home. Um, were there other options? Or can we imagine, anybody in the room, can we imagine some other strategy for them to have developed that would be, um, you know, and this is a presentist kind of mentality, but more yeah. acceptable to us? Um, or were there the accommodations they made given their circumstances, if, if you care about something like Christian evangelism, right. the best that they could do. This is, you know, I've said I don't have all the answers. This is definitely the one I don't have the answers to, but I think it's so, imp it is important to think back because it's really easy, and I do this sometimes, to say, you know, these, these Protestant missionaries, you know, look what they did. They created Christian slavery. Um, I actually have a lot more sympathy for them because I do think that they were in a, in a tough position. These were people who sacrificed, uh, you know, we were talking about this earlier, it, you know, the, the mortality rate was extremely high if you were an enslaved person in the Caribbean. It was still really high if you were a European in the Caribbean because uh, most people died, literally the majority of U Europeans died if they went to the Caribbean within the first five years. Um, and missionaries who went there, they, they knew this. So, you know, you have to, you have to give them, uh, you have to give them some credit and recognize that they're not, they're not trying to take the easy road. Um, in terms of what should they have done, I mean, I can talk about, <laughs> maybe some of you have heard of Benjamin Lay, who was one of, um, there was a there's a recent book about him. He was a, a Quaker abolitionist in the early 18th century, so when Quakers were still mostly slaveholders. He would go, he, was, he spent time in Barbados, and then he went to Philadelphia, where he, uh, he did, in order to protest um, what was happening, he did things like steal people's children to show how cruel it is, the way that, yes, I'm, I know I see like looks of shock, but that's what happened to enslaved people. Their, their children were stolen from them. So, you know, he gave them back, but like he, to make a point, <laughs> he's, he, he stole like Quaker's children. Um, he also went into the middle of a meeting and stabbed himself and had put, I, I can't remember, some a bladder of blood inside it. You know, anyway, he like performed these theatrical acts to be like, this is the brutality of slavery. How could you? Um, you know, they expelled him from the meeting. He didn't, like, he did not. So what are we going to judge people by? Okay, he did the right thing, is it sh but it didn't work. Um, you know, maybe, it, I mean, I'm sure it, it made some difference, but in some ways, um, the radicalism pushed some people away, right? Like, so it associates that type of uh, activism with, some would say, right, he was called crazy. Um, so then we can look at other people. So Anthony Benizé is another Quaker that, uh, you know, did more sort of writing and building of um, international networks. That, you can devote your life to, to that type of um, sort of social networking and um, activism. But it's, it's a hard question. How do you make things right? I, I mean, and certainly there's, there's a lot that's wrong with the world. And I, I think that you know, I would be, I want to be the last person to, you know, judge others because they, they aren't acting like Benjamin Lay and, you know, stealing other people's children to make a point. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it's, it's part of the process is reckoning with the question itself, even if we don't have an answer. So, so you mentioned uh, in passing that um, the essential textuality of uh, Protestant Christianity was an impediment <coughs> to slave uh, That is to say, mm. Um, Protestant Christianity has sola scriptura, one of its sort of guiding principles. Um, Protestants feel they need to have the Bible and use the Bible for themselves in order yeah. to be real Christians, um, and therefore to convert to Protestant Christianity necessitates uh, a kind of textuality among converts. Um, slave owners presumably fear this because with literacy comes various kinds of independence mm -hmm. uh, that might lead to ultimate kinds of uh, independence. Um, once um, slave conversion becomes an acceptable practice uh, or an encouraged practice even, 
uh, in Barbados, what do you see slaveholders doing with the remaining problem of textuality? Um, is that something else that is accommodated or divided, or how, does, how do you... Well, I think that I didn't talk about the other major movement that happens in the mid-18th century, which is the Great Awakening. Um, and the, uh, the introduction of these, this, you know, the Protestant revivalist movements, that really in many ways de-emphasized literacy. And I, I've thought, you know, when I originally thought about this project, I thought maybe this was a whole other explanation for why that type of Protestant Christianity became so popular in the mid 18th century was because it de-emphasized literacy and textuality as opposed to sort of the you know previous versions of Protestantism. Um, so I think that that also helped to make slave conversion less threatening. Um, and also missionaries, I you know there is I start chap I forget chapter eight off with a book with a quotation from a Moravian missionary writing in the 1770s and he's writing about his experience in St. Thomas in the 1730s. So a lot of time has gone by. Um, and he says that, and he, part of the book that he's writing is sort of a guide to missionaries about how to in a, a slave society. And one of the things he says is you don't need to teach literacy. It's okay, it's about the heart, right? True heart transformation. Again, and now you, you heard some of that language here. If you go back into the records from the 1730s, he was literally the first person to, to start teaching um, literacy to enslaved people in the 1730s um, and he introduced sort of uh, he he had missionaries sort of translating into many languages to sort of better uh, sort of communicate so I think I think you see a real shift both within the missionary population and within the Protestants um, sort of you know population as a whole about the approach to literacy that I think has a lot to do with the, the pressures from coming from slave owners, but it's hard to make, to make that argument really um, ironclad. But I think that's, that's what happens, that it really, it, slavery in itself is a major motivator for the, 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 these theological shifts towards literacy in the Great Awakening. Yes. Hi, so the, I'm kind of jumping off of that. You mentioned Maratha wrote yes. in an African language first, and then it was translated into the Dutch Creole. Mm -hmm. Do you know which language that was? I couldn't see whether it was Ajami or Latin script. So, oh, um, this is something I've been trying to figure out. The, the, from the best guess so far is Fawn. I'm not, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a, I've been trying to find someone who can tell me this, um, and I've asked a few people, uh, but this is a, I would say, a major research opportunity for, for anyone studying um, West African languages, because it would be amazing to be able to, you know, the translation's based on the Dutch Creole, but to be able to go back and, and look, um, and they're using sort of the same script, so I don't, I, I think that it's just the, the Moravian missionaries who are, you know, sounding out what she's saying and writing it, um, so I, I'm sure it would be a linguistic, um, fascinating linguistic project, but probably a difficult one. You know, if we think about already how much language changes over a few centuries, and then with a different, you know, way of uh, what's transcribing the, the words. This may be a ridiculously large question, <laughs> but I'm thinking about white supremacy, white nationalism, and Charlottesville. Yeah. And alt-right issues for us today. You mentioned this one shift from Christian to white. Yeah. Again, maybe just too big. Are there other shifts or anything else you want to say <laughs> about the movement to the present from this era and the language changes of this era? Um, I mean, I guess the, the biggest thing is the one, my answer to this, the first question, which was just about how whiteness itself is uh, you know, expanded and contracted over time. Um, and, and I guess the other thing is, but it's, it's still just a reiter, uh, reiteration of what I said before, is how important politics is to understanding why these, um, why these shifts happen, politics and power. Yeah. Um, so despite the substantial opposition to conversion of uh, slave, slave people, 
But you also mentioned that there is a growing population of uh, free Christian and uh, enslaved population. So what was the means of conversion for them? Right. Yeah, this was another question that I had as I, you know, I was reading one thing on one hand, you know, we can, they can never be Christians. And then on the other hand, I'm looking at the baptismal records and I'm like, well, that's not, clearly there are exceptions. Um, so I did do the uh, research on trying to answer that question. Um, and I think that, you know, in some cases it's people who, you know, like Maratha, who join, you know, you have these missionaries who are radical and hated by most of the other whites on an island, um, but they create, they, they sort of, they, they manage to get enough allies that they don't get run off the island. Um, and then they, um, you know, in, enslaved and free black people are attracted to the community that they create, the, 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 the theology, and really, in, in some cases, in opposition to their, their owner's desires, um, and in some cases with the approval um, of slave owners, they join the congregations. Um, and in other cases, I think, you know, again, people are complex. Some people say one thing and they do another. So there were um, a lot of, there were also instances where, you know, a slave owner, let's say they have, uh, they own it a hundred people. Um, you know, they think of the, you know, the, the field slaves in one way, and then they think about the, the people who work in their home in a different way. Um, so you'll see sort of uh, some, some people who uh, were, who had closer relationships with white people, then getting baptized. Another, an, another impetus is, of course, you know, you have people, we all know, you know, rape is endemic to slave societies. So in some cases, I'll have a white father bringing his mixed race children to the baptismal font. Um, and that is, that's, that's sort of an incentive, um, even though the same person might say they, they hate the idea of slave conversion um, and that they think it's threatening. So I think that you have, you know, again, a complex situation with lots of different scenarios, some of which are sort of outright sort of, um, you know, rebellious in opposition to uh, a slave owner's wishes, um, and other cases are because of a, relation, a, cl a close relationship with a white person who then sponsors, um, becomes sort of a godparent and sponsors the baptism and is uh, sort of shields that person from uh, what, you know, the wrath that they might otherwise see if they tried to enter a church. Yes. I hope it's okay if I ask another question, everyone. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to keep it. It's two prong. First is uh, following up on Dr. Lee's question. Yeah. Thinking about Virginia. So uh, I can't remember the exact year, but in the 1650s and 1670s, you start to get these laws in Virginia yeah. um, that speak to this very point about mixed race people, yep. their racial identity, their paternity, and their Christian status. Uh, you, do you, you know the work of Jennifer Morgan? She oh, yeah. She about the way in which Potter's <coughs> sequitur ventrum, uh, that's a term that means the child takes on the condition of the mother, uh, which yep. means that a, if an enslaved woman is, is raped and impregnated, or if she uh, um, is not raped and impregnated, however she gets pregnant by a free white father, the child is still enslaved. Um, so there was a case that came up in, I think, the 1650s, in which a woman was mixed race, and Christian, and on those two arguments was able to get her freedom. And then seven years later, you get a law in Virginia that says, hey, we don't care if you're mixed race, you're not gonna get your freedom. Then I think eight or nine years later, you get a law saying, hey, you you slaves and indigenous people, we don't care um, mm -hmm. if you are enslaved, you are not going to use Christianity as a reason to get your freedom. And I wonder, yes. were these folks talking to each other? Um, like, <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? Where, where the networks of like com conversation between like the Virginia colony and yeah. the folks in Barbados. Did you see? So this, yeah, I mean, and I write, this is, it, those, Virginia is so important, for, especially for the, the, the gendered aspect of slave law, right? So this, um, right, the Gen Jennifer Morgan's work is so important in this um, for showing, uh, you know, how really we should center gender when we think about what, you know, how slavery is defined in early America. Um, were they talking to each other? I mean, I think yes and no. Um, I, because I, I, I write about those laws sort of at, in order to contextualize what's happening in Barbados at the same time. In some ways, in some instances, Virginia does something first, right? Like so, the the um, the 
the law about the um, child following the status of the mother. That's a Virginia thing that then sort of spreads out. Um, the, the, the voting stuff, I haven't seen any, in any other colony before it happens in Barbados. Um, I think that probably they, they were, there were closer connections between South Carolina and Barbados than there were between Barbados and Virginia. So when you look at slave law, you know, you actually, you can see this, the, the law literally copied with some slight adaptations first in Jamaica and then in South Carolina, but Virginia was kind of its own, had a, more of a independent genealogy in terms of uh, its slave law separate from Barbados. But I'm sure that, um, that there were also people who, you know, went to both places, who may have been familiar with the, the law in either place. Um, and I think, you know, in Barbados, there's not a law saying that the, uh, the child will follow the status of the mother. But I think it was implied partly because that law had already been passed in Virginia um, and there wasn't, there wasn't sort of a direct challenge to it um, and therefore they didn't write a direct law about it. Whereas in um, Virginia you have, uh, I think it was, is, this was the Elizabeth Key case that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, and so there, again here, contingency, right? The people who challenge the status quo are they, they are the ones who instigate the, the creation of these laws for very specific reasons. And so there you see for in both Virginia and Barbados, the trajectory is the same in a lot of ways, but the, the actual details are different. But yeah, I wish I, I wish I could find that person who like took the law from one colony to the other and you know, gave it to the lawmakers or you know, to, to hear those conversations, but it's mostly speculation. Um, I was wondering what theological categories stand out in aiding the justification of slavery mm -hmm. and um, how uh, if those same categories have adapted over time to more con uh, covertly continue to perpetuate. Categories are sort of uh, justification, because I'm thinking in terms of biblical justifications, you know, like things like the curse of Ham, is, 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 that, is that what you're referring to? Um, and so yes, that stands out as, as something that became increasingly popular, especially in the 19th century, as a way to um, justify race-based slavery, even though, of course, people who know this story know that there's no reference to race in the actual Bible. Um, and other you know, pro-slavery theologians would also point to um, different parts of the Old Testament where there were um, you know, because there were slaves in the Old Testament, um, and so showing that this was a legitimate Christian practice. Um, and I would say that more generally, uh, sort of this I ideology of Christian paternalism um, was increasingly used as a way to justify and sanction slavery, and that is really the thing that I think you can see follow through into the present, sort of this idea that, um, you know, these white male patriarchs really know best and they'll take care of you. Um, I think that you can see, you can, you, you can see it really overtly in the pro-slavery propaganda of the pre, you know, the antebellum period. Um, and it's certainly in the lost cause mythology um, and we can see shades of it uh, today. Uh, well, let's end on a note of thanking Dr. Gerber. Okay, thank you.